Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the second edition of the MCI's new series, Legally Speaking. Through the Legally Speaking series, we hope to bring to you views and conversations from stalwarts at the bar, on the bench, and members of the legal community. In our previous edition of Legally Speaking, we had Justice Indu Malhotra and Sir Bernard Ricks engage in conversation. I'm happy to report that we had over 300 people join in the Zoom call who actively engaged with the speakers. I'm confident that we'll cross that number for this session. Today we have Mr. Harish Salve QC being interviewed by Mr. John Beachy. Mr. Beachy, Mr. Salve, on behalf of the MCI community and all those joining us live, I welcome you. I will first introduce both our speakers and then request Mr. Beachy to commence the conversation post which participants will be allowed to ask questions that they can submit on the Zoom app. Mr. John Vici is one of the most renowned arbitrators in the world. He has previously served as the president of the International Court of Arbitration at the ICC. Mr. Vici was also the founding partner of the Clifford Chance International Arbitration Practice and one of the first solicitors to take the role of advocate before international arbitration tribunals. He has also served as counsel and arbitrator in both ad hoc and institutional arbitrations under the rules of many different arbitral institutions. He was appointed CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in June 2016. We are privileged to have Mr. Beachy as a member of the MCI Council. Mr. Hari Salve is one of the most renowned lawyers who was de designated as a senior advocate in 1992 in India. He's also admitted to the bar in England and Wales and is a barrister at Blackstone Chambers. Earlier this year, he was appointed as a Queen's Counsel. He has previously served as the Solicitor General of India. He has also been awarded one of India's highest accolades, the Padma Bhushan. Mr. Mr. Salve has several high profile cases to his credit, both in India and abroad. His expertise ranges over multiple areas of law most notably, Mr. Salve represented India before the International Court of Justice in the Kulbushan Jadav case. I now hand over the reins of this conversation to Mr. John Vici and request him to please start with the second edition of Legally Speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madhu Kasha. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to all those uh, on the webinar. Um, if I might just pick up where you left off. Um, Mr. Salve, the two cases with which perhaps you're most um, widely associated internationally are in the field of tax and human rights, and we're here to talk about arbitration. <laughs> and I wondered whether um, you might, as it were, span, span the gap as, as beautifully as that bridge behind you does. Um, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I start by saying the way the way uh, the gaps are spanned, the tax case which, with which I'm associated, the Vodafone, crossed over into being a bilateral investment treaty arbitration, mm -hmm. which, which we argued uh, last uh, February. So uh, I started as a tax lawyer and a commercial lawyer, tax and commercial law lawyer, and had an interest in constitutional law over a period of time drifted more into constitutional law in my litigation practice in the Indian courts. And one of the things which I missed was the commercial law work because in Indian courts, there was, things are better now, but there was a time where com the only commercial work you did was arguing for interlocutory injunctions mm -hmm. and you never went beyond that. So, uh, that's the uh, reason why I felt very distant from one of my passions, i.e. commercial law. And the only place where one really got to do a trial, as it were, was in an arbitration. So by 2003, 2004, after I had been Solicitor General, I had had enough. I'd had my fill of being in courts. And in India, we are in court five days a week, 10.30 to 4. Yeah. So you even at going into the same building from 1978 to 2004, you need a change. So that's when I started increasing my arbitration practice. I found it gives 
and over the years I've realized it gives more time to live off a diary, to regulate your life, to do serious work. And arbitration is, as you know, very serious business. It's not, uh, it's, it's no longer a, a meeting or a discussion. Arbitration, we do full scale trials, mm -hmm. just that it's before an arbitral panel. So it's, it's absolutely delightful. So that's how I drifted into arbitration. But I have kept my, uh, I keep, keep in touch with my other work. And, and some years ago, I had the privilege of sitting um, with Tom Bugenthal just after he'd come down from the International Court of Justice. Uh, and I had to get up very early in the morning because the other wingman was Falin Araman. Uh, and one of the features of that arbitration at the start was that Fally and I were asking questions all the time, and Tom Mugenthal was sitting mute in the middle. And he finally said to us, uh, are you allowed to ask questions like this? <laughs> well, Fally and I said, well, yes, that's what we're here for. And he said, well, it's very different in the International Court of Justice. We have to put our questions in in advance in writing, and then the president will act as the spokesman for the, for the entire bench, and off we go. Uh, well, we cured him of that pretty quickly, and he became quite curious, uh, much to the discomfiture of the parties. But um, if I can just back a little, at, at about that time, Fadi was making the sort of comments that um, in India still um, arbitration was seen very much as the first step on the ladder. And thereafter, one had a lot of litigation ahead of uh, one in order to see a case through. What do you think has changed most about the perception of, arbitra of arbitration in India? I mean, speaking from an outsider, one, one sees examples of the Indian uh, appeal to arbitration saying we have an enormous caseload, let's get it out of the courts, let's arbitrate it. And, and then it goes the other way, steps come back and somehow the, the, the whole process is reined in once more. And it, it seems very stop-start and, and there's no real cohesion to the way in which it's taken forward. Am I being unfair or do you think that's... No, no, you're, you're, you're being polite. You're not being unfair. Uh, I have... Uh, I have a rather deep view of Indian arbitration. Things are definitely better. But when you say that, it's a very relative term of what you mean by better. The problem is over the decades, so when we were in practicing in late 70s, 80s, even in the early 90s, I hardly came across any major cases where corporates were involved in arbitration. Arbitration was something which was done, and if you go by sh the sheer numerical load of arbitration, arbitration was something which was done in 70% of the cases between government departments and contractors. And a very long time ago, even before I took Silk, I think it was in mid 80s, I was instructed by a Bombay solicitor in an arbitration and it was, I found it very complex involving work in the offshore area of dredging. And the arbitrator was the joint managing director of the company on the other side. And I asked my client bluntly, how did he ever agree to such an arbitration? It's like one of the two parties being a judge in his own cause. And his answer was very simple. He says, sir, he's not going to hear it. He will appoint some engineer. So I said, Isn't that, doesn't that get worse? He says, no, that gets better. Now, the judges know this. So when an award reaches the Supreme Court in cases like this, the judges, if it is in favor of the contractor, the judges start smelling the award rather than reading the award to see if everything is okay. So this mindset then sort of becomes the general prevailing mindset in relation to arbitrators. When you see an award, you start reading it, you start smelling it, you start touching it instead of a hands-off approach. Indian corporates got into arbitration when Indian corporates, when, when corporate India reached a stage of maturity where there were serious disputes inter-corporates. And more than that, corporates started, Indian corporates started signing international contracts outside the institutional realm. Like if, if you were an importer of food grains, you went to the institution which did food grain arbitrations, or if you were chartering vessels, you went to the 
institution which administered those arbitrations and so on, or your GAFTA, or your, you know, those kind of arbitrations were going on. But uh, the mainstream commercial arbitration, which we, which is the bread and butter of our work, came to India. I, I say, I would say, in nineties, mid nineties. And that has taken time. And that's why in 1996, we got the new act. By 90s, there was a clamor saying this old law is not working because you started now getting serious commercial cases, which was a first step in litigation because everybody said once you have, first of all, if you don't want the matter to be resolved quickly, you first start dilly-dallying about the arbitration. Yeah. Then you challenge interim orders of the arbitrator and you go on and on. And that's what Fali possibly mentioned to you. After the award comes the trial court, comes the first appeal, comes the revision and comes Supreme Court. And chances are Supreme Court might decide to second guess the award. <laughs> so it was just one more step in the litigation. Instead of starting in the trial court, you started before the arbitrator and <laughs> then went up to the courts. And do you think the... the, the, the um there is still this sense internationally because you see it both um, from the perspective of someone who practices actively in India as well as internationally. Do you still have the sense that there is a sort of chilling effect when it comes to, to dealing with arbitration in India because what is perceived to be the role not only of the courts but of the government, indeed the, the no, no, no doubt well-intentioned intervention uh, it, 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 through, through Parliament to, to cause there to be effectively a cutoff on the period of time within which an arbitration can run? You see, uh, the role of the government is in two layers. The government has tried its best to make India a pro-arbitration culture. And the government departments have done their worst to destroy the sanctity of arbitrations. Mm. Let me tell you what I mean by this. When the 96 Act came and every, everybody sort of cracked down and said India needs a new law, mindlessly, we, we copied the unicentral model, which was meant for international arbitrations mm -hmm. and applied it to domestic arbitrations. The several committee, as you know, said you cannot have zero recourse from an award. But that's what we did. Then things started going in the opposite direction. I remember for the first time when this case came up, who was the person challenging the award? ONGC. I was the Solicitor General. And when they came to me, I told them, you don't have a statable case. Three arbitrators, eminent judges, had heard the matter. It was a case of liquidated damages. They had taken the view that these are not punitive. Which court, which international court, which commercial court in UK would touch an award like this? But the Indian court in Supreme Court, when they came for appeal, I told them, you don't have a hope in hell of this. Why should the Supreme Court interfere with this? And look at the section. It only says public policy. Where's the public policy in this? Right. Supreme Court granted leave to my utter shock. All I told them is this is a new act. They said, OK, we'll read it and granted leave. When it came for hearing, they actually won the case. And that's when Supreme Court came up with all those strange ideas of when they could interfere with the award. That was the whole problem. And finally, they set aside an award like that. Now, if you say that that is what the court is going to do, don't talk of arbitrations in India. And you will see how government departments run arbitrations. I am doing four big arbitrations against government of India. And believe me, in every case they are asking for adjournments in every case they are asking for time in one case from an order of production of documents the, the usual red fern schedule an appeal was carried to the high court the high court threw it out saying there is no provision in the statute where you can appeal these orders of the tribunal they went to supreme court the supreme court stayed the arbitration for a year and this is as recent as two years back so the government's Government departments have completely, completely destroyed the sanctity of arbitration in India. And that is the reason why you see the stop and start attitude. You will see the courts take a very strong view when it comes to two corporates fighting and it's a very pro-arbitration view. Suddenly you'll get a wobbler of a judgment diluting the strictness of arbitration because you'll see there's a public sector company on one side. So this has to stop and judges have to decide that if government 
and on a policy level is wanting to make India pro arbitration, then the judges have to be hands off. And even if the government departments come to them, they should point them to the law which Parliament is making, rather than encourage this kind of adventurism. Do you think that um, things will change um, once, um, and in times like this, one hesitates to talk in terms of the effect of a dose of disinfectant? But do you think that um, do, you, do you think that things will um, improve if the private sector, uh, as indeed the MCIA is, has been doing? Do you think that their their um, arrival on the scene and the apparent desire to take up their services will, will cause something of a shift? And uh, one will begin to see um, arbitral tribunals in India being composed other than retired members of the judiciary. See, again, the biggest, the biggest offender in this is the government of India. First of all, the arrival of international institutions ensures one thing. The judges feel a lot more comfortable dealing with an award which comes out of a institutionalized arbitration, knowing that there would be a certain rigor which would have been applied to the conduct of proceedings, including overseeing the award. So yes, to that extent, it adds to the credibility of the arbitration process. But the composition of the arbitral tribunal, for decades we have had judges being appointed as arbitrators. And I must say so publicly, I have seen cases where judges are appointed by the government, the same judges are appointed over and over and over again, which is completely contrary to the spirit of the arbitration, the independence procedures, and the independent standards, which now we have. So again, you have parliament, which amended and put your entire IBA, the, the red, blue, green into the statute. I don't think any other country has done this putting it into the statute. And on the other hand, you have the government of India departments appointing the same person over and over again. Yeah. So again, there is this cleavage between the policy and their actions until this changes. And many times to corporates, one can explain that, look, your arbitrator has to be robust. He must be up to speed. International arbitration, arbitrators, when they come to a hearing, are full of the facts. You're supposed to read your papers. You're supposed to read the skeleton. And you're supposed to be up front in the game and retired judges are we have seen are not many times that familiar with commercial law that familiar with what is going on in the arbitration world to be at that stage i'm not saying i'm not generalizing but some of them are definitely not there and in that situation what you're actually happening is what happens and i've tried explaining to clients having worked on both sides of the fence as an advocate as well as an arbitrator the third person falls off the wagon. You, nobody's listening to him. <laughs> the other two arbitrators go through the motions of hearing the third arbitrator. But if you're not on the same page, you will, at best, he will give you a dissenting award. Doesn't get you anywhere. So it's more important to have an intelligent arbitrator so that you have that degree of fairness and complete representation. But it's 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 happening more in the private sector where people have started understood. The other the other problem I must confess, John, is that. We, as barristers, as, as Indian lawyers, we don't accept appointment as arbitrators. I was about to ask you exactly that question. Yeah, because you make much more money in advocacy than you do in sitting as an arbitrator, and especially the kind of practice Indian lawyers are used to. Yeah. So in one sense, even the reservoir, even, even the, the pool available for appointment then gets narrowed. So you naturally have a shift to retired judges. So this has been one of these structural problems. I see it going away. I see more and more, especially younger lawyers taking up small arbitrations as arbitrators. And I think over a period of time, this will change for the better. Yeah. And I think that there is internationally a sense that um, we've seen the real makings of generational shift, which at one point was simply not really a factor because the field was very small and uh, movement was actually quite slow. But now there, there really is a drive and uh, it upsets the purists to talk about the business of international arbitration, but that's what it is. It's, that's what it it's is. No, longer, no longer an academic discipline in itself. It's, it, it's, it's genuinely an international business. It is. And, 
um, I think it's only a matter of time before one sees, even even in, if I may call it this, a, as conservative uh, a jurisdiction as India, that the arrival of um, institutions like MCIA, um, the, the the input of people like you and others who, who would actually be prepared to, to, to fly the flag a little, will, will gradually make a bit of a difference. But it's going to take a while. It does. Uh, I must tell you, uh, there are a lot of younger judges who are now getting appointed in the, especially in the commercial courts like Delhi High Court, for example, Bombay yeah. High Court. And a lot of the younger judges who are there are very pro arbitration and very good. The problem still is the Supreme Court, and I must say so bluntly, the Supreme Court has by and large been pro arbitration, but then again, there are some times where the court gives very mixed messages. I believe recently in some hearing, the court said we will reconsider the Balco judgment on seat. Now you yeah. you can't you can't go revisiting fundamental. It, it, it's now settled in. Everybody understands it. That's that's the way the system works. Yeah. Just because somebody feels, oh, maybe this becomes too harsh on Indian public sector companies, right. or it it takes away too much from Indian jurisdiction because people don't want India as a seat. You want to change that law? You must understand. People don't want India as a seat because of what judges do in court. We always advise clients never agree to India, agree to any other place other than India, because in India, it's, a, it's you run a risk. If you get the wrong judge, it is again the first step in a long litigation. Yes. And it, it's notable that uh, I think the biggest single constituent among the users of the SEAC Center in, in Singapore uh, tend to be from India. Yes. Um, because they feel okay. so much more comfortable there. Yeah. I was going to ask you this, um, it's a long time ago now, but um, my last visit to the Delhi High Court um, caused me to be astonished by the sheer quantity of paper still scattered around. Um, we're now in an absolutely extraordinary period where, as I said to you just before we went on air, there's a sort of um, motherhood and apple pie style pronouncement from a number of the international institutions telling us we should all go remote and do things whenever possible. Uh, by, by remote link. Uh, and that will have to be the case, I suppose, for as long as social distancing remains in place. But do you think that this might form any sort of catalyst for real change in the way people, as we stop, step back and take a view about how they might conduct uh, major trials um, and indeed major arbitrations in India? Do you think there'll be a, a move to embrace new technology to try to move away from the old paper-based system? And I say that because in some respects, places like Bangalore are real drivers of, of progress in this field. And it just seemed to me this might be an opportunity really where India could take a lead as opposed to following on long behind. In fact, uh, Indian courts, and some of the courts in Delhi High Court, for example, some of the judges who feel comfortable dealing with this and the numbers are growing by the day, have what are called e-courts. Yes. Now in Delhi High Court, whatever you file, you have to file electronically in addition to paper. And uh, my nephew is a judge, so one day he showed me, and it comes to them in the evening, if you're willing to work that way, it comes to you on a pen drive. And you plug it into your laptop, which has a software, which is a dedicated software. Your, your papers are all there. You click on a case number and the case opens. You have your pleadings on one side, your documents on the other side. It's beautifully paginated. And in courtrooms, they have big screens with the facility to write on the screens. And so the judges are now following that to a very large extent. And including those screens, are connected to the uh, internet system. So if the judge wants to check up a judgment or you want to cite a judgment, he sees it in the soft copy. And some of our judges have gone to the extent they put a big screen. So when you're arguing a case and the judge says, have you checked that judgment? You'll say, I'll check it. He said, wait, I'll show it to you on the screen. <laughs> and he puts it on the screen and says, read Paris so-and-so, what you're saying is wrong. <laughs> so some of the judges have really taken this forward. And I think the next logical step for them, especially when you have limitations on this kind of social, of uh, physical appearances, is to hear cases on, on the net. And I have, uh, sitting here, argued a case in the Delhi High Court. I plan to argue one more in three days' time through WebEx. Now, if this becomes effective, then at least some cases, speaking for myself, I do not favor trials being done remotely. I don't know, maybe... 
we people are too old in the tooth to accommodate that. But when I'm cross-examining a witness, I want him in the room. Mm. And you know why. <laughs> cross-examining a witness when he's sitting in front of you versus cross-examining a witness who is on a video link. The fellow on the video link feels he's got away with it. So <laughs> I always, I, speaking for myself, I don't think at least the witness action can be done on video. Secondly, in our form of advocacy where you, as, as, a, as an arbitrator, you would be asking questions. As, as a lawyer, if the arbitrators were sitting quietly, I'd be very worried, not knowing where they are going. Right. This kind of an exchange is always most efficient face-to-face, -face, where you get the body language of, of, of the presiding, uh, whether it's a judge or an arbitrator. Yeah. Can, you, can you duplicate that on the, on the e-system? I don't know. I'm not sufficiently technically skilled, but trials definitely cannot go on to the system. But there are some hearings. And this is the other thing which I have been discussing with colleagues in younger colleagues in Delhi High Court, for example, and even with the Supreme Court judges saying, you people have to now insist on skeletons coming in advance, right. hearing, uh, reading those skeletons, asking for a reading list, and then going into the court, you will save so much time. Today, what is happening in India, and I'm, I say so point of finger at myself also with the Indian practices, the whole system, the whole case management system is so faulty. You don't know when a case is going to come up. Cases come up suddenly. So you're rushing from court to court. A, a senior QC is doing multiple cases. A silk is doing multiple cases in a day. How can you do justice to that kind of work? Right. So you're sort of pulling, you know, pulling yourself by your bootstraps as you go along. Hmm. If you have the discipline of doing a skeleton, circulating, judgments in advance, a reading list in advance, that's also reading involved by the, by the silk who's going to be conducting the case. So that change has to come. And until that change comes, we will never achieve that degree of proficiency in case disposal. But then that's again asking for a bit. So in the present situation, the judges are doing very little work, but I notice they are at least, and for me, I think that's a positive. They're getting used to receiving a submission in advance yeah. Hearing a short argument for half an hour mm. on a video screen and doing the rest on paper. Mm. I think we're all going to have to learn some new techniques as this goes on because it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's not going soon. And I, I'm conscious that a lot of people are watching this and it may be that we ought to allow them some time for questions before the session comes to an end. So perhaps I might hand back to the um, Mumbai Centre to see whether they want to... Uh, compare the questions and throw them out to one or other of us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beachy and Mr. Salve for this interesting and engaging conversation. I must say we didn't even realize how we have reached at least the end of the conversation into the question answer session. Uh, many thanks for CIA for joining. We've had questions pouring in through the first minute of this conversation. Style. I think people were just waiting to get an opportunity. Um, what we have done that is we have picked a few questions and uh, the first question that I have is uh, to Mr. Salve and this is from none other than but an MCIA council member, Mr. Nakul Divan, who's asked me to ask this question to you, Mr. Salve. Given um, what India has experienced with white and case industries, with Vodafone and all, what has your experience been on investment treaty arbitrations? Well, investment treaty arbitrations uh, involving India have been nothing short of a nightmare. And I must tell you this, India signed investment treaties. And when it came to the treaties being enforced against them, they suddenly realized they're a sovereign country who can't be dictated to by an arbitral tribunal. Nobody told them that there is a whole jurisprudence of bilateral investment treaties. There is a whole jurisprudence which has come out of ICSID. And this mindset, you have to get rid of this mindset if you even want to sign an investment treaty. It takes forever to get the government of India to agree to arbitrators. It takes forever to get them to move. They take all sorts of jurisdictional obje uh, objections. And some of the things which we've seen play out, I don't want to comment on the three cases which I have conducted, but some of the, some of the comments which you see coming out 
from the government, some of the approaches they take, the stand they take, extremely unreasonable positions. They will not agree to right from fighting over views and dates and adjournments for everything. They want more time. So it's, it's a very unprofessional way in which uh, government of India approaches its uh, international treaty obligations. So for me, it's, it's been, and then suddenly post Vodafone in, the, in that emotional moment, they, I think, decided to say, we will not have any more BITs. And they came up with a model BIT. It came up for discussion in the UK. And I was uh, one of my friends who is in on the UK side of the Indo UK Business Council told me that his Indian counterpart came who also is a dear friend and a, and a, and a client from Delhi who was sent by the government of India that you go and talk to the business council. And that business council, uh, in that business council meeting, when my friend who told me, can you brief me on some of the points on the Indian treaty? I said, well, it's wrong beginning to end the model treaty. You might as well not sign one. And when he told him that where is the dispute resolution mechanism, he says, Indian courts, he says, how can you have a domestic court de deciding international disputes? He says, don't even talk about it. Don't even talk about it. Unacceptable, not negotiable. So they said, okay, we'll come back. They, I was informally advising them. I said, well, if it is not negotiable, then you want to sign a treaty, which is a piece of, piece of waste paper, do it. And then basically, it's, it's a, what else is it? It's like government of India saying, I promise you, I'll be very good. So that they promise you even without a treaty. Why do you need a treaty for that? So this is the mindset which is pervaded throughout. And you can see by the model treaty which India has been giving out as to what really they feel about treaties and treaty arbitrations. Thank you very much, Mr. Salvi. Mr. Beachy, audience, and they want to know that you've had an experience of Indian Council appearing uh, for many years now. Kind of or a difference in the council You've frozen, Niti. I'm not sure it's this end or yours. Niti, you'll have to repeat your question. I mean, I think um, I think I got the general drift. You're asking me about um, the the way the way in which um, Indian advocates have, have presented their cases in front of me. Was that it? I can see you, Hamish. I seem to, we seem to have lost the connection. <laughs> uh, Mr. Biji, that's correct. That, that was the gist of the question. Very well. Um, well, what, one, of the, um, uh, one of the very early cases uh, involving uh, Indian practitioners was, was in fact, uh, a, a case in which I was sitting in Delhi. Uh, and I've since done four or five major arbitrations where Indian counsel have been involved. Um, one of the... Um, most arresting features of that case was that uh, the tribunal comprised uh, a, a very senior Indian uh, advocate at one end of the table. I was on the other wing, and in the middle was an Australian, former Solicitor General of Australia. And already among the tribunal, you have three different uh, ways of speaking English and three different traditions of presenting cases in court. In front of us uh, was a, an absolute delightful and very able, quite young Indian senior advocate. And on the other side, um, a New York lawyer, who remarkably for that species was very urbane and very polished and not prepared to go in like a terrier at the very first opportunity. So we had a very measured presentation from the uh, American side. And then we waited to hear what the respondent had to say. And back came about the most aggressive, pointed, ad hominem attack I've ever heard from a man who'd previously been one of the most mild-mannered gentlemen you could hope to meet on the street. <laughs> and we had to stop. We actually had to stop. And it then took me to say to the chair, I think what you're seeing here is a simple difference in approach. If you go into the Delhi High Court on a busy day, the style of advocacy you hear there is something which would cause an English judge to blench. He simply wouldn't put up with it. And you begin to realize that even within this, well, I say, but it's crazy to call it a small a common law world, there are so many different ways of presenting a case. And once we've made the point, 
to both sides so that the American didn't feel he was being singled out for something particularly nasty. <laughs> um, they actually got on extraordinarily well, and, and it worked. But it was quite amazing to see this very immediate and very direct culture clash between the two sides. Uh, I have to say that since then, I've, uh, the most recent case involved uh, Indian Council on both sides. Uh, and, uh, and there it was just a question of getting used to the slanging match and letting them get on with it. But um, it, again, it worked because they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew the culture and the background and all the rest of it. And it didn't stop the, actually the underlying quality of the argument was very good on both sides. There's no two ways about that. But it, it, it's, um, it is quite remarkable. And it's not, it's not limited to, to advocates coming from the common law tradition. You see this when uh, the civil law get going as well. They're completely different ways of doing it, depending entirely on the, on the, on the, the practice. But I mean, um, Harish is much better at this than I am. I mean, you've seen these, this sort of thing in action. But the, it, it, for me, it was, a, it was a real eye-opener. It's something to watch this explosion, apparently, in front of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Beachy. I hope I'm audible now. Um, one last question to you before we come to the close of this uh, interview series is that a lot of people are asking me this, that how both of you actually manage your time so well. You're busy counsels, you sit as an arbitrator, you travel through jurisdictions, and then you're able to take out time to do these webinars and interview series as well. So any tips on time management for our audience? <laughs> Um, what, what time management at the moment is, is rather imposed because in 40 years I've never stayed in one place for so long. Uh, and to that extent, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a feature of um, what, what we're going through. But uh, generally speaking, and I suspect uh, Harish will have exactly the same reaction, one ends up spinning plates very fast indeed and just hopes that they don't start crashing down altogether. Uh, it is a matter of being really quite disciplined with the diary. Uh, in my case, these days, I don't appear as counsel anymore, uh, no doubt to the relief of arbitral tribunals. Um, but I do sit as an arbitrator in an awful lot of cases. And it really is a question of having a very small and dedicated team behind one and an ability to be shepherded, but equally to make sure that you're on top of the stuff as it comes up. Uh, it's, it's not easy, um, but I, I have a feeling that um, Harish Salve would be rather better at managing his time <laughs> than I am. Well, uh... Well, well, John, as you very rightly said, it's always a question of spinning plates. I thought when I had withdrawn from day-to-day -day Supreme Court practice, and I thought I'd be able to live out of a diary. Definitely doing arbitration work and practicing in the UK is a lot more regimented. Having said that, with my kind of luck, I accepted the brief in the Vodafone arbitration in 2012 the Jadav incident happened in 2017. Their hearing before the International Court of Justice of the, the on merits in the Jadav case and the Vodafone BIT arbitration were back to back. Oh. The dates were going to clash. Fortunately, the arbitral tribunal, when the government of India, which who instructed me in Jadav, was opposing the dates a week <laughs> after Jadav, for, for a week before Jadav for Vodafone, the, the arbitral tribunal came down hard and said, Mr. Salve has far more important public duties appearing uh, for you in the ICJ. So we will not listen to you and fix the cases one week apart. So in two weeks, I did two possibly of the most difficult and important cases of my life. So yes, we are sort of always uh, worried about the place crashing, but to Indian colleagues, all I will say is you have to resist the temptation of piling too much onto your plate. Take only that much which you can do well. Thank you, Mr. Beach and Mr. Salve. It was lovely to have you on the series. Um, and, and we thank him on behalf of AIA. Uh, we have the next series which is coming on uh, where we have the General Council joining us on Monday, 4th of May. We'll have Nish Shetty interviewing Mr. Shiva Manjil from Tata Sons. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Salve and Mr. Beachy, for all your support. And we look forward to having you back with us sometime soon. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very bye -bye. much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye.